Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome and thank you for joining us tonight for this special celebration. Tonight, we celebrate the virtual launch of the book, Redefining Theory and Practice to Guide Social Transformation, Emerging Research and Opportunities, published by IGI Global, by Dr. Beth Fisher Yoshida and Joan C. Lopez. Our audience tonight is incredibly special and is made up of folks from Columbia University in New York City, all the way to our Colombian friends in South America and everywhere else in between. This book and event are great examples of the scholar practitioner model, which is the bedrock of the School of Professional Studies. Faculty like Dr. Fisher Yoshida and Professor Lopez demonstrate how they blend their rich real world experience with a deep understanding of academic theory. Their book is based off their research and work in Medellin, Colombia, but presents ideas that are practical and applicable to many other locations and conflict scenarios. This book is an example of the NECR program and SPS's relationship within Columbia University, specifically NECR's partnership with AC4, the Advanced Consortium on Conflict, Cooperation, and Complexity, which is a part of the Earth Institute here at Columbia University. Dr. Fisher Yoshida is the co-executive director of AC4, and Joanne has been conducting research with Beth at AC4 for several years as the program manager of the Youth, Peace, and Security program. Joanne is also now a lecturer with the program, so welcome, Joanne. Um, Beth, uh, Dr. Fisher Yoshida is a professor of practice at the school and an integral part of her academic governance, besides being one of the best colleagues you could ever work with. So again, thank you for joining us tonight. And now let's begin the celebration of this great new book, Redefining Theory and Practice to Guide Social Transformation, Emerging Research and Opportunities. Thank you, Eric. Thank you so much. So yes, I'm Beth Fisher Yoshida, and not, I'm going to dispense with the titles, but uh, my main areas of focus are on working with youth leaders in communities, uh, conflict and organizations, and women and negotiation. And Juan? Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Eric, for such a warm introduction. Um, so my focus of research is really on, on the aesthetics to the responses to violent conflicts, uh, especially by youth leaders in, in Latin America. Um, and with not too much of a preamble, we would like to share uh, an introductory video um, of a collective with whom we work in, in Medellin um, that uses the art and popular education, the, the, the pedagogy school that was uh, given birth by Pablo Freire in Brazil, which takes education um, as, a, as a tool um, that is always in function uh, with the necessities of those who are being educated in such, um, in such paradigm of education. Uh, and before I sh we show the video, I also would like to give a special thanks uh, to some people that collaborated in the, in the writing of this uh, book and that are not present in this, in this presentation. So Julian Serna, who uh, wrote with us um, a chapter on monitoring and evaluation. Uh, Wilmar Martinez, who, who um, also helped us and co-wrote co with us uh, a chapter on building relationships. And then to Catalina Koch, who um, was gracious to write an epilogue to the book, and Aldo Chivico, uh, um, a friend, a colleague, who wrote the preamble to the book. And Andy. And Andy Goodman um, also, who has been uh, a, key, a key figure in all of this. So with that, we, we, are, we are going to watch this video just very short about uh, EPA, the school that I just mentioned, um, whose leader, whose director is uh, Chifo, uh, a graffiti artist or a graffiti writer as he, um, likes to be called, um, and, and Angela also speaks here, who is a collaborator of EPA. Check it out. 
La Fundación EPA Resisto y Pinto es una escuela popular de artes que busca brindar procesos formativos, intercambio de conocimientos y metodologías artísticas con base en el graffiti, muralismo, ilustración y pintura, no solo desde su aprendizaje técnico, sino para fomentar el pensamiento crítico y reflexivo sobre la ciudad y sus acontecimientos. Como proceso, comprendemos que el graffiti y sus expresiones desde el arte urbano son como una fat cap, trazos amplios y difíciles de ignorar, son el medio artístico más cercano y directo con las comunidades. Las calles se convierten en el lienzo perfecto que invita a personas a expresarse, cuestionarse e inquietarse. Permiten que uno como adolescente o como joven se adentre más a la vida artística y, y a la vida creativa y pienso que muchos de nosotros necesitamos lo mismo. Thank you. Such an inspiring video to see the work that IPA is doing. So we uh, had an interest for many years in understanding the dynamics of urban violence. And we had also done work in Newark, New Jersey. And then we were invited by our colleague, Aldo Civico, who had been working in Medellin, Colombia for more than 15 years at that time. And over six years ago, Juan and I went, Juan is actually from Colombia to begin with, but we went to Medellin and started meeting with different youth and uh, to understand the different processes that they use because we wanted to understand what was going on inside of these communities that was transforming conflict and what were the role that youth leaders were playing because traditionally youth were associated with either being victims of violence or promoting violence. And we were noticing that there was something else going on. They weren't, they were creators of peace and conflict resolution. And so we wanted to work with them and understand how are the methods they're using reducing conflict in these areas? Apart from, from what Beth just mentioned, um, one of the reasons that we chose Medellin, um, it's because of its history um, and also the history of the country. So Medellin became a sort of a recipient city for those who were displaced due to the conflict that most of us know here, uh, taking place in Colombia for over 60 years. And those uh, in the city, you find the expressions uh, of different kinds of conflicts, um, but also the responses by communities, by community leaders to such um, conflicts. And thus, Medellin then becomes or can be conceived almost as a, a, a microcosm to be sure of, a, of this conflict, but also as a laboratory in which there are um, as Beth was saying, a lot of tools, a lot of technologies, practices by community leaders um, from which people concerned, interested uh, in conflict resolution, in negotiation, in conflict studies, etc., uh, can benefit if, if we get to better understand it. And, and with this then, um, we, we thought about how to approach um, the, the research, the practice, etc. And it seemed um, that the only way to do it was to do it in, in the most collective way possible. Um, Co-creating, co-thinking um, around these, these issues. And thus, um, because one of the objectives of, of our, our research, of the programs where we work at Columbia, 
uh, are concerned with perhaps um, reducing the gap between academia and the field. Well, we said we, with our colleagues in the field, can contribute to this and perhaps start building bridges between the academic field um, of conflict transformation and also the practices and the knowledge of grassroots um, knowledge and, and, and practices taking place in, in, in Medellin in this case. And then as the result of this, of course, there is information, um, there, there is data, there are some findings that need to be uh, disseminated. Um, and then of course, this, this uh, product, this book, it's, it's a representation of the dissemination of those findings. So when we started our work with the wonderful youth leaders in Medellin, we didn't have an intention of writing a book. We just wanted to learn what they were doing and trying to figure out how could we be effective representing and uh, respecting and admiring the local knowledge that the youth leaders had of their environments and the knowledge we had from the academy and other areas of practice that we had done. And so over the course of a couple of years, we started to learn more about each other and started to figure out ways that our methods fit together so that we could come up with something unique, something effective, something sustainable. And then we got to the idea of the book and documenting our process because so many great things were already happening. One of the other advantages we had at being at Columbia University is that we were able to provide access and to sort of amplify the great work that the youth leaders were doing. And so the process of how we engaged in the book, we believe is very reflective of the whole process of how we work with others. We did not want to write a book claiming their methods as ours because they're their methods, right? And some are ours. So we wanted to co-construct and co-write, co-create a book that really represents all the voices of the different people we've been working with. And then we were going to um, think about how do we measure and evaluate the effectiveness? And so we've been working on projects with uh, different youth leaders and we're continuing to work on projects to refine the whole idea of monitoring and evaluation. Because a lot of this is very lucid and it's hard to really put um, a frame around what it is that's making social movements effective because they are sort of dispersed all across the community. And so we use a lot with uh, narrative and really understanding how people tell the stories about their experiences, how they tell the stories about their lives. And a lot of these are very constructive stories. What we started to notice is they didn't focus on, oh, I'm a victim of violence, I've had such a difficult life. They talk about la resistancia, like the resistance and how they were able to overcome. And you'll see when we get to the next video that um, our colleague Augusto talks about the context and how important it is to understand the environment that you're in, the situation that you're in, and also historically, and not to give his age away, but he's been doing this kind of work for more than 30 years. And so we'd like to play the next video now where Augusto can tell us a little bit about how he sees historical context as being very important. Saludo amigos y amigas. Mi nombre es Rafael Augusto Restrepo Agudelo de la ciudad de Medellín. Y estoy muy feliz de hacer parte de esta publicación a la que invitan la profesora Beth Fisher Yoshida y Joan Camilo López. Eh, esta publicación sobre las formas de resistencia organizada en Medellín, sobre los repertorios con los que la movilización social ha resistido no solo al fenómeno de la violencia, sino a condiciones de pobreza estructural y y de destierro y de otras formas de, de discriminación, pero que desde ahí han surgido formas muy bellas y muy potentes de agruparse y de generar alternativas. Eh, fui el responsable de escribir la introducción como una invitación a reconocer el contexto de la ciudad y de la problemática. Y frente a eso, bueno, son tres cositas. Uno, la violencia, como el eje de esta narrativa. Así no nos guste tanto, pero ha sido el eje de esta narrativa. Dos, al narcotráfico como fenómeno social que también ha tejido las relaciones en, en esta realidad. Y tercero, a las formas de resistencia, a esas expresiones desde lo comunitario, desde el tejido juvenil y cultural, 
que han marcado mmm, creo que una ruta muy clara para que podamos, observando bien estas expresiones, poder generar eh, réplicas o mmm, otros proyectos de características similares en cualquier lugar. Eh, muy contentos por esta mmm, juntanza, por este vínculo que se sigue estrechando entre la Universidad de Columbia con la maestría de resolución de conflictos y los procesos de resistencia en Medellín. Creemos que esa alianza sigue fortaleciéndose. Este libro es un producto de esa relación y queremos presentarlo con mucho cariño porque sabemos que han sabido interpretar muy bien los aprendizajes y las lecciones aprendidas de nuestra experiencia en Medellín desde un contexto global y eso es bueno. Eh, espero les guste y bueno, por último decir que este capítulo de la resistencia se sigue escribiendo porque dentro de nuestra narrativa, como lo dije al principio, la violencia ha sido el eje, el eje primordial y creemos que tenemos que generar otra narrativa desde lo que ha significado resistir y construir alternativas de construcción de paz en los contextos violentos. Y Medellín es el laboratorio social por excelencia en el planeta para esto, por su nivel de complejidad social y por el nivel también de complejidad del fenómeno de la violencia. Pero también ahí está la pista de la creatividad enorme que existe en el tejido social para enfrentar esto. Espero les guste mucho y seguimos en contacto. Seguimos, seguimos. So, uh, as Augusto was saying, context is very important and the city we can think of as a system we can think of different neighborhoods in the city as subsystems of the city which is also a subsystem of the whole country and so on and these contexts are very dynamic so systems don't stay the same they continue to change and evolve over the years so when he was talking about also continuing to work and continuing to change the narrative continue to change the transformation is also because of this changing nature of what's happening in the communities and that we need to understand that people bring their experiences with them to everything they do, whether it's conscious or not. And so capturing some of this information also informs how we intervene, right, with people. So one of the things we noticed, as we mentioned before, is that youth leaders and others were doing a lot of really constructive, creative work in these communities to foster social transformation. And one of the questions we kept asking is that, well, if everybody from outside or people who are not part of those processes were talking about the violence and how terrible life was and how difficult the conditions are, we said, you know, it's really interesting because life still goes on. Things are still happening. People are still getting up and going to work or going to school or going to the market and still cooking. So life is still going on. What is it that's happening in this environment that allows people to continue to be motivated to want to live and to want to make a difference. And so we took a very appreciative approach to this and asked the question, why aren't things worse? Because if everything is so bad, then nothing should be able to be good. Yet we still have art and we still have different kinds of aesthetic expressions. There's still laughter, there's still socialization, well, before COVID, right? There's still socialization. And so we're wondering, what is it that's happening? And so part of our process in working with people is to get them to also identify and document and name what is it that's working well in the system that inhibits the violence from being worse, right? So then other things that we used, other methods and approaches to inform our process in our field work is also something called Theory U that Otto Schammer had helped develop that we used inside of a social lab, which I'll tell about in a little bit. The theory you process has three main chunks that you go through, and it's not a very linear process. And it, there's no set amount of time you spend in each of the phases. It really depends because sometimes you're in phase one, you go to phase two, you go back to phase one, which informs phase two and so on. So the first top part is really downloading the information and really figuring out and sensing what's going on. And this means going around and visiting and seeing and tasting and smelling the environment that you're in, having conversations with multiple people all the time and really starting to observe what's going on. It's one of the benefits of actually going to a site and being able to do field work. And we understand sometimes there are constraints such as the virus or sometimes violence peaks and you can't access a particular neighborhood to work in. And that's what we do have a part in the book on 
doing your field work virtually because sometimes you do need to do virtual field work for a variety of reasons. So you're downloading all this data and, you're, and then you go into the second phase, which is really presencing and trying to process and make sense of the data. What does this mean? How do I understand this? How does it connect with other pieces of data that I have? How does it connect with preconceived notions that I may have had or what I might do, which then goes to the third phase, which is really about the performing and really about the acting. You're crystallizing what you've learned. You're putting things into prototypes to test them. And then after you do the prototype, you probably have to go back and re-examine and resense and so on. So it is an iterative process. Another person's work we admire very much is somebody named John Paul Lederach. And he has some wonderful information about things he's done in the field. And he talks about uh, in The Moral Imagination, one of his, our favorite books of his, is about listening and that it's not a passive activity. You don't just listen for words, but that you actually are very much engaged in the listening. It's a very action, relational way of listening. And a quote that he has is, in the midst of that very human mess, listening is the art of connecting and finding the essence. So it's really about building the relationships, which we think is so critical to do because how do we know how to connect with other people? How do we really listen from the heart and not just the mind to really hear their stories and really hear why they're saying what they're saying and why they're telling us and why they're telling us the way they tell us and so on. So Juan? And listening, and listening it's, it's, it's critical. This active listening that Lerak speaks about um, because it actually drives the, the practitioner, uh, the person that is in the field into understanding what are those things uh, answering this question that, that Beth introduced uh, aren't worth, right? This active listening takes us into actually uh, um, identifying these things. And I, I want to mention something um, related to what Augusto said in terms of narrative. Um, the, in, this, in the city of Medellin, there is the constant narrative of trying to tell the story of the city through uh, the, the violence that the city has indeed, right? We do not want to negate that fact, uh, experience. Um, but something um, that, that together um, with, with our colleagues, et cetera, have been wanting to do is also perhaps to find the way, the way to tell the story of the city through another narrative, um, shedding more light into what we came to, to call the repertories of peace building. Um, and this has to do with artistic manifestations, uh, artistic depictions of how is it that people respond to conflicts, like concrete um, uh, practices, and also with leadership. What, what is the role of leadership in, in, in the making of these repertories uh, of peace building. And some of the findings we have been able to evidence is uh, the importance of networks. And not only networks um, of, of, of people, perhaps that currently uh, are community leaders in the city, but these historical networks. Um, the sharing of knowledge from practices taking place, let's say in the 80s, in the 90s, um, perhaps when Narco-trafficking was another of the factors um, that, that were present in the city and fueling into the conflicts. Um, how are those things being transferred through historical networks into the present? Um, so that's one thing. And um, something that we also hear about a lot in the field is this idea of process. So when, when one asks uh, someone, a community leader, um, what is it? that you, you or your collective does, uh, most of them say, well, we are part of a process. And this has to do a little bit with the network, right? It's a historical leadership and peace building process that really started in Medellin as people coming from rural areas, um, they started to then make a living in the city, finding ways um, to also, as they say, resist, right? To the, to the conditions that just continued to fuel on, on, on the conflict, on the violent conflict for the, for the most part. Um, and some of, the, some of the examples perhaps of these resistance movements are technologies and methods used, for example, to cross from one neighborhood to another when there are 
the so-called invisible borders and where people from this part of the neighborhood cannot cross into the other. There are these um, artistic parades, these concerts that you have implemented as a way to open up spaces so that people can uh, retake, uh, have presence again in spaces of the, of the neighborhood that um, were not available for them due to um, gang violence, the presence of militias, the presence of paramilitaries, um, et cetera. And of course, the actual collectives, uh, schools like EPA, the, the one that we just saw, um, Graffiti La Cinco, Sombata, and, and different collectives around the city that really have operated historically uh, in the city to not allow perhaps for things to be worse. Um, so one other, other finding um, that we have evidence is that processes of conflict transformation, of, of um, social transformation really emerge from within conflict areas. They do not come from outside. Um, and what we have seen though, is that for the most part, these processes of conflict and social transformation are reactive um, to, to the conditions um, and are not that much proactive. Now, this is a question actually um, uh, getting prepared for this with Beth that we still have in, in, in our minds of how to understand um, whether these things are reactive or not, uh, these, these processes and how to also think about sustainability, um, right? If these processes are only reactive, it means necessarily that they're not sustainable, but given the things that we have um, evidenced, it seems that there is some sort of sustainability in these processes, at least in these historical networks that I just mentioned. Um, and now we are going to listen to Claudia Gonzalez, um, a partner of, of our work in, in Medellin for many years, uh, a dear friend, uh, and also a community, a youth community leader since she was uh, very young, uh, and that um, Cole wrote with us a chapter on self-awareness and the importance of self-awareness into the making of conflict and social transformation. Hola, soy Claudia González, profesional en planeación y desarrollo social líder juvenil de la ciudad de Medellín. Eh, primero agradecerles a la AC4, a Joan y a Beth por invitarme a participar en la escritura de este libro. Eh, es muy importante porque nos invita a llevar desde la experiencia eh, todos estos conocimientos que tenemos como líder. Eh, yo participé de la escritura del capítulo 2, desarrollo, de desarrollo en sí de un agente de cambio. Eh, en este capítulo desarrollamos una historia de cómo es el desarrollo de un agente de cambio eh, a partir de sus motivaciones, sus tránsitos, sus eh, relacionamientos, la conciencia de que es ser un agente de cambio y cómo ese agente de cambio comparte su experiencia con otros. Eh, esta experiencia eh, en este capítulo fue basada también desde una historia y una mirada personal porque invita a que nos guíe como desde cómo una persona, un líder juvenil, es consciente de lo que está haciendo por su comunidad y sobre todo que está haciendo una transformación para el mundo. En ese capítulo eh, lo que concluimos es que para ser un agente de cambio eh, debe tener la posibilidad de poder ser conscientes de sus historias personales, familiares y comunitarios, cuáles son sus motivaciones, qué, cuál fue el tránsito, qué, la llevó, qué lo llevó a que se incentivara a ser un agente de cambio, a que se preocupara por su comunidad. Eh, y concluyo con la siguiente frase, y es que para un agente del cambio eh, eh, debe tener la posibilidad de poder motivar a que muchos jóvenes se permitan ser, luchen por sus sueños, sus ideales personales, profesionales, personales y familiares, y sobre todo que la conciencia de poder ayudar a otros. Muchísimas gracias 
y espero que eh, la lectura de este libro sea de sus expectativas. Gracias. So yeah, as Claudia talks about herself as an instrument of change, and it's very important, we believe, that self-awareness and understanding who you are and what you bring to every situation you're in, what motivates you, what your values are, and so on, is very critical because you bring yourself and then you have a connection and then you build relationship. And again, that's something else that's not static. It's something that's continually changing. Every time you have an interaction with anybody, there's an opportunity to reflect on that interaction and to grow and learn from that experience. And so uh, Claudia, from the first time we met her, you know, several years ago uh, till now is remarkable how she's grown and changed and is so effective in her work. And when we talk about instrument of change or change agent or instrument of knowing how to make effective transformations in communities and so on. It's really about um, making yourself as best as you can be because the best you are, you bring that to whatever you're doing. And so really thinking about how you engage with others, how you respond to others, how you really think about and are intentional about what you say and what you do and all of that and how you maintain your integrity in the relationship that you have with people is critical. And so being an instrument of change, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that. And we believe that it's something that you need to continue doing. And it's very much a part of what we do in the Youth Peace and Security Leadership Certificate Program we have. It's very much what we do in the NECR Master's Program. And ideally, we hope it's what everybody does in the work that they do because it's life work. Um, and, and it's also um, a, a reality, no? The, we, we are not isolated beings in the world. And, and thus, what we do has an effect, of course, in, in our, us personally, but also in our surrounding. The people that are surrounding us, uh, the context that surrounds us, the, the environment, et cetera. And thus developing this awareness of our positionality in the world, um, then, of course, comes with a great responsibility um, but it also empowers, right? Because then one starts to conceive oneself as having effect um, on, on, on the world and as one's actions having an effect on the world. And then the question is how to assess, right? The quality of the interactions that we have with others, with the environment, et cetera. So when we get to know ourselves, we really should not make the assumption that we know others be based on what we know about ourselves, right? We really need to make the effort and spend the time to really understand who else is involved directly and indirectly, because you know there are lots of forces at work and lots of indirect influences that influence the uh, context, right? And this is something that you can just see in your everyday life about who is in my group and who is not in my group and how do we make somebody other or how do we bring somebody in to relationship. And these are some of the things we talk about in the book and each chapter has a different focus, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But the whole idea that just as much effort as you put into knowing yourself and honing your skills at being an instrument of change, I think you really need to put into understanding others because they're also not static, they're dynamic systems in themselves. And so you need to constantly reassess because as you grow and develop, your dynamic changes. And so then your impression or understanding perspective of the other changes too. So it's an iterative, constant process. And so one of the things we did talk about was not only to do an intervention, but also to sustain those changes. And in order to do that and not only be reactive, you need to have some kind of structures and systems and process in place. Some of that comes through an organizational structure, some of it doesn't. And so it's not enough to only have passion about wanting to do something different. It's not enough to only have creativity to do something different because those are very critical parts of what you need in the process, but you need to have a process that is sustainable that you can continue on with that others can also continue on with. So it's not totally dependent on you as one resource, but that there are you're building capacity as you go along. And so in the next video, our colleague Kelly will talk about creating organizations and process because she's gone from sort of the soup to nuts all the way through a whole process. It really is good at helping create organizations that can carry transformation through a process. Hola, mi nombre es Kelly Juliana Valencia López. 
he estado en proyectos sociales, comunitarios, culturales y juveniles alrededor de 18 años en la ciudad de Medellín. En este momento, eh, la hace cuatro, yo a nivel me invitaron a ser coautora del libro que escribimos con ellos dos y junto con unos compañeros de acá de la ciudad. Eh, tuve la oportunidad de escribir el capítulo sobre desarrollo y consolidación de organizaciones. En este hago una propuesta de ciclo de vida de las organizaciones donde eh, propongo eh, como tal, no con la idea de imponer, sino con la idea de que tengamos una base para poder darle un norte a las diferentes organizaciones. Eh, para comenzar, entonces, tenemos la gestión inicial de las organizaciones. En esta, eh, es un asunto de una conversación, de una discusión, de un parche de amigos, donde tenemos un sueño, una idea, un propósito. En este primero, eh, es muy importante entonces eh, conceptualizar el término de amistad. Amistad eh, es muy importante para las organizaciones, ya que se vuelve la base de la solidaridad, de la empatía, del compañerismo, de descubrir las experiencias que otros hemos tenido eh, para poder eh, organizar toda nuestra propuesta y poder pasar al siguiente nivel, que es la consolidación de organizaciones. Digamos que esta consolidación es un asunto más de eh, trabajo interno de la organización, qué es lo que se quiere hacer, el objetivo, la misión, la visión, toda la planeación estratégica. Se hace un trabajo interno tanto de las organizaciones como de las personas que eh, estamos en ella. La idea es conocernos, conocer las experiencias, conocer cuáles son los intereses y qué es lo que buscamos cada uno de estos sujetos participantes. Una vez de que está consolidado todo el tema de la organización, pues la idea ya es salir afuera, salir a diferentes espacios de participación, escenarios artísticos, eh, políticos, eh, de discusión, un poco para evidenciar lo que se ha hecho internamente hacia el exterior y también recoger experiencias externas para retroalimentar lo interior. Eh, ya acá pues la organización está eh, aportando a diferentes procesos en un territorio eh, y digamos que se vuelve un poco más visible y se debe llegar pues como al término si se quiere pasar a un, una consolidación, a una constitución legal. Esta constitución legal en el caso de Medellín se, a, se hace bajo la Cámara de Comercio. Eh, ya acá hay unas responsabilidades tributarias y es un asunto más de que la organización puede contratar. Muchas llegan hasta ahí, se desprenden otras organizaciones, simplemente se decide terminar con la organización o se vuelve a comenzar el ciclo un poco para un trabajo interno de la organización. Como se los mencioné, pues la idea no es que sea un asunto de camisa de fuerza, sino que lo podamos moldear, organizar, proyectar para cada una de nuestras problemáticas, situaciones y posibilidades que tengamos con diferentes asuntos dentro de la organización. Eh, le doy muchas gracias a Joan, a Beth, a la AC4 por hacerme partícipe en este proceso. Eh, estuve pues como plasmando la experiencia con la que he contado y además aportando para que quedara sistematizado todo un proceso que lo hemos desarrollado con todo el amor. Muchas gracias a ustedes por comprar el libro, por leerlo, por aplicarlo y poderlo proyectar también con todos los cercanos. Eh, espero que lo lean, lo disfruten y lo apliquen. Muchas gracias. Something pivotal in in the in the making in the sustainment in the development of of social organization has to do with with relationships um and and kelly speaks about something um central here and it's friendship but not friendship um as as we commonly understand it but also as this relationship that creates things um given a, a shared a shared experience Right? So a lot of the organizations, um, grassroots organizations, 
really starts, of course, as Kelly say, around friendships that really share um, deep experiences. And then, um, because it's all about relationships here is um, there are some very sensitive, very delicate things that we need to consider um, as we go into the field as organizations themselves start to operate in specific context um, that have to do with legitimacy, with trust, with credibility, um, et cetera. And one of the challenges um, I think, and, and lessons learned also uh, with that, has been um, on how to, how to choose, how to interact with specific people, with the specific organizations, et cetera, because each person, each organization has a history, right? Has a legitimacy, a credibility, or, or the absence thereof. Uh, and so as we establish um, relationships, given if it's person to person, organization to organization, these are things that we have to have some sort of tact um, as we do it. And those, I mean, all of this is connected, those the importance also of reading very well the context, in, right, be, before actually uh, starting to implement um, initiatives before engaging in, in um, let's say, legitimate relationships with people, with organizations. Um, right? Because of course, each relationship sort of um, shows an image, projects an image of the quality of, of the elements that are part of, of, of that relationship. Um, yeah, I think. So building on that is um, who you show up with makes a difference, right? Is what Jerome was saying. And um, you may think you're being discreet or careful and so on, but you don't always know the history. So you do have to develop relationships to understand the implications of who you're working with and what does it mean to be associated with people there, right? In different groups. And so field work is very messy process. It's not a very structured lab in terms of what you do in a very controlled context. It's not, it's very uncontrolled. <laughs> And so there are different things that happen where certain kinds of behaviors or certain kinds of dynamics show up in the process that are really an example of what gets in the way in people's lives anyway towards transformation. Well, all of that shows up in the process. So because it's so messy and there are so many moving pieces all the time, you really need to have a structured process in there. So the tension there is how much flexibility and adaptability do you need while still maintaining the integrity of the process? And then how much of the process should you impose or get people to buy into without being rigid? So it's that flexibility, rigidity kind of balance that you try to strike. And as long as you have a process, as long as you know what it is that you're doing from the beginning towards the end, then you can have all that mess because if you get confused in the in the flow of things, you just go back and check where am I in the process and then you keep resuming from there. And so the whole concept of the book is really a, about the process. And so going from the beginning to the end is a suggestion of a flow, starting with self-awareness and other awareness and building relate, knowing the context and building relationship and so on. And so if you follow the flow of the book, then you're really following what our process is in our work and engagement with the people that we've worked with. So processes have in, intentions, goals, aspirations, uh, just as, as Kelly was saying, a group of friends, friends gather and say, let's do this. So there are these intended sort of results that, that we want, right? Um, coming out of our, our, of our project. But because we live in complex systems, um, and what we do in one place may have an effect on another area of the system, system being in this case, a neighborhood or the whole city. Um, we have to be very attentive on, on, the, on, the, um, on the consequences on the effects that we want to have. There are some unintended consequences as a result of, or, of very well intended um, projects. And something that, that Kelly um, mentions here is sometimes the dissolution of organizations. And, and we have to consider the fact that some of these organizations are also friends organizations or group of friends um, that, that came together to do this. And if the organization disappears, if it starts to have problems, that has an effect on the friendship, right? Uh, on the relationships of, of the people that composed it. 
And these are some of the unintended consequences, uh, perhaps that we um, would like to, to avoid, one of them. Uh, others are, uh, as for example, in the case of, of um, the beautifying of places through urban art, right? To the making of a mural in a particular uh, place, perhaps where there is presence of, uh, of, a, of a particular gang. What perhaps it does beautify the place at the, at the short term, opens up a space for people to move around the neighborhood, um, to inhabit this, this space again. But there is going to be um, a reaction by the gang members, for example. So all of these things have to be taken into consideration as we develop, implement, um, and, and, and monitor and evaluate our processes. Right? There are things that can be avoided, um, perhaps. There are things that can't, um, but there are things that, that can be avoided and there are ways to foresee this, especially using uh, systems thinking approaches. And so now we are going to transition into, into the last uh, experience, into the last um, voices outside of, of here, last videos. Um, which is a group of, of artists um, in, in Comuna 13 in Medellin. They are called uh, Sombata and, and, and they do re pretty much um, pedagogy, but through concrete educational um, strategies, uh, but also with the use as a tool of the art, which, which become very important. They do hip hop on the one hand, but also traditional music from Colombia from Afro, Afro descendant, Afro Colombian communities that uh, have had an effect on the, on the very identity of the members of the group uh, itself, but also of those who share experiences similar to them living in, in Comuna 13. Where so their, their, their name again is, is uh, Sombata. And let's watch here, it's mostly music and a little bit of images uh, of Comuna 13. del Salado, de Eduardo Santos, somos chicos de todos lados de nuestra comunidad de aquí. Quiero que se conozcan, que hagan amigos, somos una familia. Somos una familia, no mire a nadie como extraño, no, no se sienta extraño. Con todo el cariño, con todo el corazón y con todo el amor del mundo, bienvenidos y bienvenidas. Mi nombre es John Jaime Sánchez, eh, soy artista también, hago rap desde los 16 años, afortunadamente hasta hoy y eh, hago parte de este colectivo del que ustedes hoy han entrado también a ser parte.
saying before, this intriguing question has always always been uh, for us. How is it that processes such as the ones that we saw here that have effects on communities can be made uh, sustainable? How can these things not only are responsive to specific um, events of, of conflict of whatever nature, um, and, and reduces the conflict at that spe spe specific moment, but how to make them sustainable in a way that they prevent um, conflicts, right? How to change the system in a way then that these, think, uh, that these issues do not um, emerge again. So one question is how to institutionalize um, the practices, the methods uh, used by organizations such as Sombata that have opened up um, spaces for, for conversation, for negotiation in, in Comuna 13, um, but how to make them institutional, not only in this specific area of Medellin, uh, but perhaps in the city as a whole. And out of those lessons um, in the process of making this institutionalized, um, how can those lessons also be applicable perhaps, or, sh or shed some ideas into contexts that have similar characteristics that are pre perhaps not only uh, in, in Medellin. And, and um, this is really the nature of approaching um, social transformation, um, conflict transformation with the lens of a systems thinking thinker. Okay, so to not only look at, 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 at this, at this um, effects, right, at the symptoms of a problem, but to look actually at the basic conditions that produce and reproduce um, problems. So the aesthetic is from the Greek meaning being sharp in the senses. And we think about art, it's really not, or the arts in general, right? Not just visual art. It's really not only an add on to our lives but it's really what fulfills us as human beings to feel human and to feel whole, to feel holistic. And another quote from John Paul Lederach is that sense creates meaning 
and sense touches, it sees and experiences things as a whole, not in pieces, and it puts together and holds them there. And so it's the aesthetic experience that they're having in their communities. And you know, when you see these videos, you think like, how can you not love this work and doing this work and connecting with the people that we're connecting with? And if you think about the youth that we just saw in that last video with Sombata, it's giving them a sense of purpose, a sense of discipline, it's the aesthetic, it's a sense of identity, it's a sense of fulfillment, and it's a sense of also co-creating some, something fantastic, something beyond what an individual contribution will be. When you look at the synergy and the synchronization of what they're doing together and the repetition and the sense of pride that they have in really being able to work together effectively on some beautiful aesthetic it is really beyond what we can think of as just a day-to-day -day life. It's, it really makes it much more fulfilled. And, and then the question is, what is the, the social function of the art and, and, and of aesthetics, um, right? As, as Beth was saying, it is, it is, art is not perhaps only for the sake of beauty, for the sake for the, for the beautiful, but there's a social function um, into it. And, and what, what we have seen is that um, the making, I'll use again this, this example, the making of a mural which has aesthetic components into it, it's beautiful, etc., also creates spaces for conversation. So as, as, as many of us know, Colombia went through a peace process recently um, and towards the end of the process, um, there was a plebiscite. So the government, um, the two parts asked the Colombian people whether they wanted uh, peace to be negotiated um, between FARC and the government or not. Uh, the, plebiscite, the plebiscite was lost, people voted no, I mean, it was divided, but at the end, people more voted towards a no. And one graffiti artist in, in Comuna 13, actually very enraged uh, by the results, came out and did a graffiti in the middle of the neighborhood saying, uh, people do not want peace here. Um, it's a literal translation of what he wrote. And then he told us um, that days after, some community members came out and said, this is not true. We, it is not true that we do not want peace. Um, in fact, we do want peace, but we would like to be more included into the decision making. We want to, a process that is different from the one perhaps that was, um, that was implemented, et cetera. And thus, out of those conversations, a new graffiti came out um, in which the graffiti artist, having talked to a lot of community members, Kate simply said, well, in fact, it isn't that people do not want peace. It is that people want to participate, right? And those, um, the, the, the social function, right, of this aesthetic, aesthetic piece of art then becomes more of opening spaces for negotiation. Which means also that there's, when there's negotiation, there are spaces for unifying, for unifying people, for coming up with plural perspectives on a particular issue, in this case, peace, for example, right? So then uh, art creates um, social spaces for negotiation, for conversation, for creation as well, uh, simply to hang out as well, right? And this is a, a powerful social phenomenon beyond, as Beth was saying, the, 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 the aesthetic. There is also a, histor a historical archival process into, into the making of a song, right? Uh, a, a paint, a painting, uh, um, a graffiti, right? There is a, a historical, because it tells a story about a particular time, um, the perspectives around that time, um, et cetera. So it's also like a historical reckoning as it were. Uh, and it gives voice to some sectors. In the case of urban art, especially, it gives voice to certain sectors of the population that have been ignored into, into the most explicit ways of making a city, in, into the government, for example. Um, right? So this is also this utilitarian function of the arts um, that goes beyond the aesthetics. And then building on what Joan was saying, another thing it does is, you know, when you have violence, they claim the land, they claim the territory as violent, and that keeps people in their homes 
for safety. And so by coming back out and putting up these graffiti murals and having song and dance in the street, it's a way of reclaiming that land, reclaiming that space as their own. And it really changes the dynamics of a neighborhood when people have increased mobility because they've reclaimed these spaces. And so um, some of the methodologies that we have, such as um, I mentioned systems being dynamic. So there is something called dynamical systems, which we use to practical theory and how to understand the different systemic dynamics that are happening. So you know where to increase or decrease kind of feedback loops that happen there. As well as another methodology we use, CMM, Coordinated Management of Meaning, to really capture and understand, deconstruct the narratives and the stories people tell to really see what's going in and how do you shift those stories because the dynamics are shifting and the behaviors are shifting and the reality, their social reality is shifting. And we also measure and capture that in the narratives. So the, here we have an opportunity to be creative with our colleagues in the field because we can take these tools that we're bringing from the academy and then modify them in ways and fit them together in different kinds of creative ways that make sense. And this is something that we have an ongoing process in developing more monitoring and evaluation tools. Because one of the uh, challenges is in trying to really document, as we mentioned earlier, how do you measure success? How do you measure that you've made a change in a social transformation? How do you measure that it's a sustainable change and that it is a systemic change, right? And you have different levels. It could be micro, meso, macro. There could be individuals who are changing and collectively they're creating a dynamic that shifts and changes the community. And so it's an art and a craft in the practice of how we do conflict resolution and peace building initiatives in communities. So now we're going to share a uh, mural. And the thing that, one of the things that's interesting about this mural, in addition to the fact that it's just a fabulous mural, is the process in which it was created. So this particular mural was um, a product of a process from a, a foundation of Pintuco. And one of our colleagues, Wilmar, who's there in the blue shirt and tan pants, he led a practice and actually he led this process and we didn't know about it until it was finished. So it was a two year process where he took some of the learning that we shared over the years. We've been working with Wilmar for more than six years and he used CMM. He used this communication perspective approach in working with community residents and Juan mentioned earlier that there is a peace process that took place in Colombia. And of course, whenever you have a peace process initiated at the governmental track one level, it still has to integrate down into the communities, down the ranks into the people. And so what Wilmar did was he was working with different community members and they were looking at what does reconciliation mean to you? What does it mean to reconcile with others? Maybe people you don't know, maybe people you've had direct violence with, maybe people who were parts of groups that were violent that you suffered from directly or indirectly. So he went using CMM in a very accessible manner with people and communities and captured the stories they had about what reconciliation mean to them. And so this also echoes what Joan was saying is that people, it's not that they're against peace, they wanna be part of the process. People wanna be heard, they wanna be acknowledged, they wanna be recognized. And so Wilmer captured those stories with the community members and then he invited in a group of graffiti artists and the graffiti artists worked with those stories and the community members and with Wilmar and they created this phenomenal, tremendous. And we put, we made sure we were in there just to show the size of this mural. And this is a two year process, gathering the stories, connecting the graffiti artists with the community members and their stories. And they came up with this beautiful visual depiction of what reconciliation means to this people. And it's in the front of the Museum of Memory in Medellin. And, and following up on, on what uh, you Beth was saying, were, were saying is that uh, there, there is a craft into, into the making of these uh, graffiti in the sense that, uh, of course, the graffitis have their own craft, their own art. Um, the people that were involved in, in, into the making of the concept of this have their own uh, craft, their own art, their own understandings. And then they applied uh, some of the some of the modules of CMM of the coordinated management of, of meaning in order to put all of this together. Right? So there is um, also, as, as you were saying Beth before, these different iterations of the same thing because CMM, Wilmar has used it in other contexts, etc. cetera. Um, but he sort of moved it around um, to meet the necessities of this particular uh, project, right? And then this allows us to speak 
of of making um, of engaging ourselves in conflict and social transformation also as a craft, right? Um, not only as as this let's say um, practice um, or, or or conventional practice. And um, on on my part, lastly, I, I want to say that uh, this is part of the language of the city. Right? We live in uh, linguistic worlds. And, and thus the messages that, that we produce in our projects have to also be connected to the aspirations that we have of that project, right? So something to always keep into consideration is the message, the language that is used in the process of making projects for social transformation uh, and, and that are very well connected with, with what we want. Yeah, so it's a beautiful... And Presentation and sorry, it makes people feel whole and, and they feel acknowledged because their story is being told in such a great way. And the tools are adaptive and they're only useful if they're relevant, right? They're only useful if they really do foster and help people make sense of their world, make sense of their story and um, lead towards the transformation that they want. So we're opening it up now to Q&A. There's a Q&A box. Please send your questions in. And we're really happy to engage with you. We wish we could all be in the same room engaging, but it's all have to do for now. We do have one question or a comment. Somebody was saying before when they heard me talking about the um, presencing, the theory you part, right? And the crystallizing and prototyping and so on. And that the person is really just saying, yeah, I agree. It is a, an important process in using um, Theory U. And one of the things is about Theory U too is it's not only your own witnessing of the city or your own witnessing of neighborhoods, but it's witnessing the neighborhoods in collaboration with other people. So it's in conversation with other people. And even if you think you're familiar with some areas of your own city of the world, you know, by having, uh, by looking at it with other people, then you get a different perspective on your own environment too. And so that's very enriching because even though you've had a certain experience, you don't know what that other person's experience is, right? And so when you leave your neighborhood and come back to it, you can see it differently. It's the same thing as seeing it in collaboration with other people. So as we're waiting for more comments or questions to come in, I just wanna mention also that uh, because we wrote the book as a representation of the process we work with other people on, we're also uh, in the process of translating the book into Spanish. So it will be available in Spanish at some point in time. And we are also going to be developing workshops and so that other people of the community and youth leaders can also participate in workshops to learn more about the methodology. Of course, what we're saying here is just the surface part and even what we have in the book is rich and you can probably adapt it and use it on your own. And there's also another layer of understanding and efficacy from participating in the workshops. So Juan, did you wanna add something there? I, I want yeah, I want to add something, especially on the theory you part and on the process um, through the theory you um, building up on, on what you said. And it, it seems like a lot of the conflicts are precisely on 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 disagreements on things. And thus it's so important um, to in this in the in the in the in the group of people that are going through the theory you process, let's say if we are doing a social laboratory, a social lab. It is important to have a diversity in the group so that we look at the same social phenomena, the same issue from very distinct perspectives, also to try to comprehend what is it that the other is disagreeing on in there, and then trying to come up with sort of a shared understanding um, of the issue. So the richness perhaps uh, of this is the production of a, of a multi or pluri perspective um, approach into any specific issue. So I wanted to add also that if anybody wants to write a comment or question in Spanish, we can also take that, Juan. Si, si, alguien, si alguien quiere preguntar algo en, en español, por favor, adelante. Okay, we have a comment here. Great presentation, looking forward to reading the book. Um, Unintended consequences were mentioned. So I wonder what kind of unexpected situations you encountered and how you overcame them during your field work. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, I'll just 
say what comes to mind right now. And hi, Brian. Sometimes you um, don't always know what an effect of something is going to be. So maybe we engage with somebody like we talked about before who has a reputation we're not aware of. And so sometimes good things can come of that. Sometimes bad things can come of that. And other things around unintended consequences is sometimes you think something's going to work well, but you're not taking other things into consideration. So for example, uh, if there's a certain group you're working with, then the unintended consequences could be that if other people are not included in that group, they feel left out and then other dynamics happen because of them not feeling included, right? So that's an unintended consequence. And sometimes you want to have a group that's representative of the bigger system and the different layers, but sometimes you don't necessarily have the right people in the room according to some perspectives. So you're always dealing back and forth with the tension of who's in the room or not. And what you don't wanna do is you don't wanna create conflict. You don't wanna create problems. And sometimes inadvertently you do just because you don't know all the different nuances in the system. So you build relationships, you rely on those relationships and the information they provide for you. But sometimes, uh, you end up in situations that you didn't anticipate. And sometimes they're good. You say, oh, wow, there's a ripple effect. That's good that I didn't realize like, yay, what is that? And let's see how we can promote that more. And, and, and talking about these, these um, desirable unintended consequences, one of them I, I think can, can be the, the murals, right? Um, I mean, not perhaps that, that explicitly we participated in the making, but through Wilmar, through our experience, through our um, relationship with Wilmar, et cetera, through the knowledge that was produced in this relationship, um, the mural came about many years later. And I and, and also remembering here Beth, uh, a walk that we took two years after um, in, in Comuna 5, in, an, in another sector of the city, where two years before we had a conversation about perhaps uh, beautifying a little bit this, this pathway that that was uh, that had a, a hidden beauty, perhaps it was just a a, a, um, a conversation. And two years after, we went back, and the area was completely transformed um, as a result, right, of these interactions, of these conversations. So there are indeed also desirable um, or, or positive unintended consequences. Which is where you can't really measure things by time, because what it, what is the concept of time, right? You plant a seed, but you don't always know when the seed's going to grow and you don't know what's going to take hold in a conversation. And so that I remember that example, that was a beautiful example because it's unbelievable how they transformed this space into a beautiful public space. So go ahead. So any, any plans on incorporating the book into in, in, in public schools, K-12 settings in a near or far fetched future in the US or in Colombia? Um, well, not, not explicitly, uh, I, I think. Um, I mean, in fact, the book is just coming out. We are, as Beth mentioned, uh, mentioned developing workshops around it, et cetera. But I, to, to, thinking about the public, I think it's not very clear um, yet, but it might be a good idea. I don't know what you think about that, Beth. Well, you know, we did some workshops with high school students that incorporated some of the methods that mm. were using in the book, right? And drawings were great with that. And so we had some really interesting results that um, the concepts were grasped so quickly. It was really refreshing. So, um, you know, I think as an educator, one of the challenges is how do you make information accessible to whoever the audience is? And so that could be an interesting project that we do in conjunction with other people. So if there are, if you, Maria, or somebody else wants to engage with us in making this adaptable, to grades K through 12, happy to do that and take part in that conversation. And Sophia here asks, um, oh, this moved, hold on. Oh, sorry, it's up on top. How did you engage with your, how did you engage with your positionality during these processes? Um, I, this has to do, I think, uh, in part with the, with the discussion on on uh, building relationships, uh, on the discussion on legitimacy, on the history of us as individuals, of our the organization that we are representing, et, et cetera. I think if I understand the question correctly. Um, and 
there are mixed there are mixed experiences about this. Of course, we I personally am from Colombia, uh, and this perhaps eases the, the the transition into building relationships in specific settings. Um, but I also represent a university uh, that is foreign, um, that is an Ivy League university from the United States specifically. The United States has had a relationship with Latin America that is very particular, not positive in one in some cases, positive in others, and and and, and these things become then challenges that are only resolved in in honest conversations, in 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 engaging with time. Uh, we have been working here for already six years. Uh, we visit um, the city, the people very regularly. Um, um, so it's it's not a transactional sort of relationship um, what we have with Medellin, um, but it's really always always uh, in, in constant um, flux, etc. And then the positionality. Uh, of us perhaps representing the university or the US or how, however people conceive it, then it starts to fade away a little bit because then you start meeting people uh, uh, and people meeting you uh, as humans, right? Yeah. Uh, but it's indeed uh, a challenge, Sophia. It was all the time. And especially for me, more so than Juan because Juan Colombian, so he has a different affinity with people there. I didn't want to be, you know, the person from the United States speaking English and going there and telling people what to do. That was the last thing I wanted to do, uh, being the ugly American or the imperialist, right? So um, we just, just, you know, uh, connected with people, tried to be respectful, went on these tremendously long hikes for four hours at a time, all through up and down the hills. When people wanted to show us places, we went and we wanted to see them and we wanted them to tell us their stories. We wanted to hear what they had to say, what they wanted to share. And I, we thought of it more as an honor that people were sharing their lives with us, right? And so we wanted to be respectful of that. And then I have to say, you know, going out and doing salsa dancing and drinking guaro is not a bad thing to do to connect with people either. So you need to be culturally sensitive and connect with people in a way that makes sense. And because we took guidance from our friends there that we developed, you know, when our friends advised certain things, we paid attention and we listened and we respected and really valued their contributions. And so we tried to be respectful all the way through the whole process. And hopefully it is. I'm sure I've probably offended somebody at some point in time, but, uh, you know, not intentionally. Juan, I see there's uh, questions in Spanish. Question in Spanish. Yeah, so Cesar pregunta, ¿cómo han cambiado? Oh, perdón, había otra. ¿Cuál ha sido la posición de las autoridades de Medellín al trabajo que están desarrollando? So the question here um, for the English audience is, what has been the response um, or the position of the governmental authorities of Medellín in our work? I'll answer it in, in Spanish and then... Pues, o sea, yo creo que siempre ha sido muy bienvenida el, el trabajo que hemos desarrollado en la ciudad desde el inicio. Esto tiene que ver mucho con, con, eh, con la persona, digamos, que nos abrió las puertas a la ciudad, que es, eh, que es algo chico. Eh, entonces, desde el comienzo siempre hubo una apertura, una disposición eh, muy amplia al trabajo que estábamos haciendo. Eh, yo creo que iniciamos con el gobierno de Aníbal, de Aníbal Gaviria, después eh, con Federico Gutiérrez, eh, y ahorita con esta nueva administración sí no ha habido ningún tipo de, de relación, en realidad, eh, pero eh, eh, anteriormente sí hubo una apertura total. Yeah, so I want to add that that's tricky, right? That's a tricky relationship because um, government, the state has a certain kind of a reputation, different kind of people, so we have to be mindful about how we engage, but in working with um, the Secretary of Culture, Secretary of Youth over the years, uh, and it's changed, different people have been in those roles. We've had very warm reception and um, we have worked with them. And there's uh, something called a participatory pro budget process that happens in uh, Medellin as well. And so um, some of the people that we work with have also done projects that have been sponsored financially by the local government. And so we've worked with them on that. But um, wherever the state can play a role and be constructive and engaging citizens in uh, where they can feel heard and be acknowledged and do good things, then we're on board with that. 
Can you please speak on how, on if and how maintaining trust is a part of your process? If you don't have trust, then people are not going to be open to you and things are not going to work. There's going to be a surface politeness, perhaps, or, in, or ignoring you completely. But if they engage, it might be surface, but you're not getting to a deep connection and a deep transformation. So one of the things I think that's helped us build trust is, you mentioned Aldo and I did too before, is Aldo Civico. Who you are associated with makes a difference because Aldo has been there and developed a wonderful reputation with lots of different people. Then because we had an initial introduction through Aldo that also opened the door and people had a level of trust with us because of that introduction. And then the other part is that we keep coming back. We keep returning. And if we say something, we deliver. If we say we're going to do something, we do something. We've uh, you know worked with people. They've gone with. A, they've come to New York. They've gone to uh, Barcelona with us at a conference, and we continue to go back. And once this pandemic moves on or allows us to travel, then we'll go back again and continue the work. And we've been engaging remotely in the time, so you have to constantly pay attention. And if you build good relationships, then you can do that. You can maintain the trust. Um. Yeah, I mean, just, just to reiterate what, what you said, Beth, this constant um, coming back, delivering, uh, honoring honoring opinion, honoring other ways of looking at things, et cetera, are part of, of making and also keeping the trust um, between between partners. Cesar? So just, we have to just do one or two more and then wrap up. Okay. So let's do the, the one in Spanish and then the anonymous. Eh, ¿cómo, ¿Cómo han cambiado con esta metodología de trabajo, por ejemplo, la situación de seguridad de los jóvenes de las comunas? So how have, uh, how have we changed through the use of these methodologies, the work, uh, sorry, through, these, through working with these methodologies, um, the, situ the security um, experience or situation of the youth of some of the uh, comunas? Eh, yo, yo creo que en realidad nosotros no, no hemos cambiado nada. O sea, eh, lo que hemos es ofrecido algunas herramientas para que el trabajo que ya vienen haciendo los jóvenes en las comunidades se, se, se fortalezca. Eh, no, con, no, con, no de un modo, digamos, eh, impositivo, sino, sino solamente con la idea de que se recreen estos métodos eh, y que sean adaptados a las características a, la, a, los, a, las, en, a las características particulares de la, del, del barrio y ya los jóvenes las han usado digamos a su forma eh, pero nosotros no, no, pues no hemos cambiado nada alrededor de esto. So just one more question about uh, whether any individuals who would have identified themselves as children, youth, or adults who are formerly associated with armed forces, armed groups, child soldiers, and was the community opening to welcoming them as part of these processes? That's complicated, right? And um, somebody could be, and we've, we've met many people who were part of gangs or were part of gangs or were in the paramilitary or were a guerrilla. So sometimes people just transform from one kind of violence to another looking for opportunities to survive. And that's very well known, but that is one of the challenges that's happening right now in Colombia is about the reconciliation and reintegration of former armed combatants into society. So we have had um, opportunities to work with people who are in those situations, and it's a mixed bag about who's ready to open them or open their arms to them or not. And part of what we do in our process is being able to change the narrative and change the dialogue and so that people are able to welcome them into the community and that they become constructive contributing members to the to their society because if you just keep them isolated and estranged that's not going to bode well i think in terms of moving forward so that is all the time we have um, just want to say thank you to everybody for joining us this evening the recording will be available I guess to all the people who registered and it will be a link on our website. So it'll be the NECR website at Columbia University and it will also be the AC4 website. And I believe that we did have a link in the uh, chat at some point that was shared with you about a link to the book. And if you do have any questions or follow up or ideas for next steps for anything, then please feel free to get in touch with us. 
Thank you everyone for attending. And for those of you who have access to Clio at Columbia, the book is already available there in PDF form. So if you wish to access, please do so. Have a beautiful night, everyone. Gracias eh, a las personas en Colombia. Un abrazo. Thank you, everybody.